This lecture is on migration and constituent remittances and development. So, so uh, uh, migration is now becoming an important issue. I think all, almost as you have already known that is Trump is trying to uh, restrict the migration into the into the U.S. and there is also a lot of uh, uh, debates on what is the, con the, 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 the contribution of migrants, particularly of the high skilled migrants to the U.S. economy. And so this kind of debate is now going on. Our, our concern here is not the developed countries. Our concern is how migration is contributing to the developmental outcomes of the countries of origin. These countries of origin are essentially the uh, developing and underdeveloped countries. And, uh, and now before going to the uh, details, and uh, in this lecture we mainly, development is a broader concept, it includes many dimensions. For instance, if you look at the report by Stiglitz, uh, Kesson and P2C, uh, the, uh, submitted to the French President Sarkozy Commission, Sarkozy Committee report, it is called the Report of the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress. You can download it from the website. The, the understand where this is that development is a multi-dimensional concept. It is not just economic development. It has many dimensions. So, uh, in this lecture, uh, so my many dimensions that that report essentially considers around uh, eight the eight dimensions, including material prosperity, health, education. Uh, governance, uh, environmental aspects, social uh, security, and so, uh, there are many, uh, that is, development is a multi-dimensional concept, not sim only confined to economic development. However, in this lecture, we, by development, we mainly focus on economic development, that, and uh, at the end, we may give some, uh, we may have some discussion on the, uh, on the impact of migration and remittances on other aspects of development. So now, coming to the this, uh, so uh, people migrate from their countries of birth or origin for various reasons: for be getting better jobs, for having higher, better higher education, as well as nowadays you can also see that now people are now it's not a recent phenomenon. Uh, people also move as refugees or asylum seekers because of the uh, ten uh, tension in the. Uh, in their own country, like a civil war, famine, or uh, religious persecution, all these things. However, when we look at the data, what we can see is that the share of the refugees or asylum seekers is very low. Uh, we will see the num numbers very soon. And uh, a larger share of the international migrants belongs to the uh, labor, labor category of labor migration, that is, people who migrate for getting better work job or hybrid jobs so now and the important issue is that international migration has important implications for the countries of origin as well as for the countries of destination and uh, that des destination countries are mainly developed countries we will see the data now soon, soon. and the origin countries are mainly the uh, poor, underdeveloped, or developing countries. In this lecture, we focus on the uh, impact of migration and consequent remittances on the development of the uh, countries of origin. And, and uh, so, this is uh, now this lecture. Now, I want to do this that this lecture is broadly divided in structure as follows. First part of the lecture, we discusses the trends and pattern of international migration and remittances. And the second part, we will discuss the developmental impacts of remittances. Now, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, this first part gives you an idea about the, its importance in the, uh, in the current world. Now, look at the numbers. Uh, this is the trends in international migration from 1970 onwards, of course, in a five year interval. And this is the stock. Now, this original source of this data is. Uh, is from the UN Population Division. That I collected it from the International Migration Report 220. Uh, original sources further. If you want, you can also download it from there. It is available in the Excel sheet. 
now there is a this is the stock of international migrants the her migration now the import there is an issue in the data which the un report is also recognizing uh, suppose uh, i to identify a migrant in is, is on the basis of citizenship that is suppose when we are looking at the citizen migrants in us they consider all those who are not citizens of that country so it is it actually underestimate the migration because many indians have gone from your india to us and took their us citizenship so they will not be considered as uh, citizens uh, so they are not considered as migrants so it it, it may not for our purpose it may not have much big implications because the our concern is essentially developmental impacts in the origin countries those who are permanently settled they may not send any remittances back so they may not, they may not be have any impact on uh, economic impact on the origin countries those who took citizenship in these countries but it may have an impact on the cultural aspects in the destination countries so the social and cultural issues so this is the, what you can see is that, eh, that this is the stock of uh, migrant in over time and what you can see is that it is increasing continuously so now within this what you can see is that uh, the stock of refugees and uh, asylum seekers that is very low in, uh, in the world it is only uh, in 2009 it is only 10.6 percentage and you look at in higher income countries only the, the, the refugees and asylum seekers account for only 2.7 percentage and uh, and the larger part of the asylum seekers is in the refugees in the low income countries so now you can also see the change in the growth the growth rate of migrant stock uh, this is also a five year interval annual growth rate what you can see is that uh, the world as a, the world as a whole uh, for the last uh, four years uh, 15 to 2019 the growth rate is only 2.2 percent as for but you look at the high income countries the growth rate is always very high and uh, near to the world average but when it comes to the low income countries and it is fluctuating and low income countries it is largely due to the uh, increase in the refugees but in low and middle income countries it is very low now look at the age structure of international migrants 52 percent of international migrants are male and 42 percent are female so that 50 50 relationship is, is uh, ratio is almost uh, maintained now look at the uh, in of the inter 74 percent of the international migrants in 2019 uh, belong to the working age population so it is largely a labor migration now look at the countries of origin of international migration. The, the major source uh, that is uh, India accounts uh, is the this is the we are presenting only the top countries of foraging international migrants in 2019 and the numbers are in millions. India is, is the first and Mexico, China, all this. And you can also see these are also countries where population density is very high or more populated countries. So now this is the countries of destination of international migration where you can see that uh, most of the countries are uh, very developed countries, United States, Germany, or rich, rich countries. Then except maybe yeah, Russian, but yeah, that's also and yeah. And you can also see the migrant workers by destination. Destination uh, uh, that is low income countries account for a small percentage of the uh, uh, percentage of the and high uh, around the, in 2017, near 70 percent of the migrant workers moved to high income countries. Now you can also see the geographic distribution of migrant workers uh, by sex, and then here you can see is that uh, northern and northern and southern Western Europe is and North America can account for a larger uh, sh sh share of the migration in 2017. Yeah, 
Now the important, the, this is the broad picture. What we can learn from this broad picture is that a large part of the migration, international migration is a worker migration and the destination countries are mainly high income countries and the countries of origin are mainly poor countries or developing and underdeveloped countries. Now we will look at the impact of remittances. Remittances is, with, is very important. So here you can see that a net official, I'm giving and plotting the net official and aid and remittances for into the middle, low and middle income countries. Look at nine, up to around 95, uh, official uh, aid is higher than the remittances. But after 95, what you can see is that these countries are getting more in terms of remittances than in terms of official aid. So now in terms of external flow of resources, remittances is assumed to, is the one of, is, is, is an important, is an important, is assumes an important position. Now you can see the top 10 countries receiving remittances. For example, that is in four time points, 2005, 10, 15, and 2018. And in 2008, you can see that China, Mexico, and India is the order. And the order is remaining the same, except in 2015, as Mexico has gone down. But in 2018, what you can see is that India, China, and Mexico. This is this picture is also emerging from the uh, from the uh, countries of origin. Where also India, China, and Mexico account for the largest share of the international migrants. So and they are also accounting for the largest uh, uh, level or absolute value of uh, value of remittances. Now here there is an issue. The why, as we have already seen, that record of remittances are increasing largely, and is largely, and there are different many factors are many reasons are attributed for them, and among them is the better data collection and uh, reflecting awareness of the developmental importance of remittances, as well as concern money loan, uh, concerns about money laundering and the risk financing. Here, the important issue is that there are some uh, uh, discussion on the uh, estimation of remittances. There are a lot of data issues. And there, this data issues discussed in a one World Bank uh, publication that we will see later. And here, usually remittances are account in most of the developed countries where the statistical system is much better, but remittances are included in, in the two categories. One is called the workers in remit transfers from abroad, and another is called the compensation to workers in the balance of payment. These are the two headings. Now, the issue is that uh, in some cases, uh, the remittances will evade all these official rules, official or that is rules which is where we can account. For instance, you may be knowing that before the uh, exchange rate of liberalization in India, that is before 1991, a larger part of the foreign money came to India through, how, through, uh, through what is called, a, you may be knowing, Hawala rule, that is not through the official, through the official channels which can be, uh, which, which the statistical agencies can capture. So these kind of uh, just data collection or accounting issues are there. Therefore, in this one, there is also uh, uh, opinions which have different views. For example, McKinsey, 2014, they are working for World Bank working paper. They says that, uh, that during the last two decades, that is the increase in the remittances is vastly overstated. But the, when we read, go through the literature on the estimation of remittances, what you can see is that uh, in, in large number of countries, uh, this is uh, reasonably uh, accurately estimated. But uh, in some poor countries where there are a lot of restrictions are there, the uh, uh, remittances are getting into the country through channels which the statistical agencies cannot capture. So this is the remittances story. Now look at the, what is more important is that not the absolute value of the remittances, but what is the uh, what is the size of remittances in relation to the size of the economy? Here you can see, you can see the different picture. I have plotted the top 30 countries which is getting remittances as a percentage of the GDP 
but you can see is that a large there are uh, all the 30 countries are getting emittances with, uh, which is having a share more than 10 percent of their gdp and uh, most of the countries belong to the what is called poor countries in africa asia is also nepal is the then uh, then uh, when, yeah some uh, European countries are also there. So, but now what we have is that the top and in terms of absolute value, India, Mexico, and China account for remittances. But as a percentage of the GDP, these are the countries which is accounted for the highest share. Now, this is important. Keep these numbers in mind because the impact of remittances on various aspects of the economy depends upon its share in the GDP. So, if it accounts for a larger share of the GDP, it can have severe, it can have important implications on the economy, economy of that country. Now we will see what is the what is happening in India. In, in India, uh, what you can see is that uh, uh, Indian contracts, uh, India account in, uh, in two thousand. I have what I have given is the share of remittances in India's GDP. What you can see is that it is earlier around 3.5 percentage and it is now it is around 3 percentage. This is declining and partly maybe because it is in just GDP is growing faster than the remittances. And here I have the I have the trend in the share of remittances in GDP. What you can see is that yeah, this is important. The, this this will explain to us some what you can see is that initially the remittances is increasing and this is also 90 what is this 1975 is important is this is also the time this oil boom happened in the middle east gulf countries so many large number of indians migrated to gulf and then the one of the reasons for the increase in increase in the remittances in, in is this but after that, what you can see is that after around maybe 80 onwards, the remittances as a percentage of GDP is declining. From 1990 onwards, what you can see is that this percentage is, that is the share is increasing, that is the ratio is increasing. This is partly due to the fact that we have we moved uh, uh, what is called a uh, liberalized exchange rates so that uh, the larger part of the remittances must have come through the official route. That is earlier Hawala transactions are, must have declined because even the Hawala transactions happen because to, uh, because of this mainly because of this exchange rate exchange rate restrictions. Now this, this is the first part of the uh, first video. What we are now what we are seeing is the trend in migration and trend in remittances and. Uh, to summarize what we can see is that, uh, that migration has increased, increased and mm -hmm. then uh, in, in terms of absolute number of migrants in, in India, China and Mexico account for the, la the larger share but in terms of the uh, remittances also we account for that but when the remittances as a percentage of GDP, as GDP uh, that there are large number of African and countries in Asia account for that, and, and in India also, uh, uh, my question, as we already see, see it will generate a substantial, uh, substantial welfare impacts, uh, impacts for both the uh, uh, countries of origin as well as countries of destination, uh, uh, countries. Of, and uh, here in this lecture, as I already told you, that we are focusing on countries of uh, origin, and uh, in the the. Or the the first part of the remaining thing, while well, first we discuss is the impact of migration and we, then we focus on the impact of remittances. So, and within the impact of migration, there, there is a, uh, that is the, the impact of um, uh, very across whether unskilled people are migrating or skilled people are migrating. So we will discuss these two issues separately. Now, coming to the migration of unskilled workers, unskilled workers, the one important impact of uh, economic impact of uh, unskilled mi migration is that uh, it will reduce poverty in developing countries because the migrants themselves can move out of poverty. And then, second thing is that it have an important 
uh, it can improve the labor market conditions for the other workers. For example, a large number of people are moving out. It will improve the, it will reduce the supply, and therefore, it is quite possible that it will increase the wage rate and as well as reduce the unemployment or underemployment in the countries of origin. This is good for the. This is good for the uh, for the countries of origin. Uh, now, uh, for, uh, yeah, there's, there are, in, now the, the, the lecture is the slides are prepared in such a way that uh, for each topic I discuss the issue and then I discuss the empirical evidence on that and the slides also contains the references so that those who want to read further they, can, they will get these references. They can uh, easily uh, see what is which are the references they have to look at it. So now, uh, regarding the uh, wage and employment impact of the uh, mig unskilled migration, there are uh, many two, uh, some prominent studies out there. For example, Lucas says that uh, uh, Lucas paper shows that uh, the migration to South African mines in, from five African countries increased the wage rate in, in the countries of origin. Similarly, World Bank site studies that show that real wages in Pakistan, construction sector, and Philippines manufacturing sector closely trace the deployment of overseas workers. And I have done a study in context of Kerala. As you may be knowing, Kerala has a larger share of people working outside. For example, uh, around 10% of the uh, 30, uh, uh, 3 million, uh, 30 lakhs people are working out, uh, abroad and uh, migrants that are sending uh, remittances. And I did, I did a study recently, what is impact on, uh, impact on the growth and uh, other aspects of the Kerala economy. Well, I have shown that Kerala's, uh, that remittances and migration actually increases the wage rate of the agricultural workers. Well, the agricultural workers are not the people who migrated, but the other, other type of workers who migrated. But it even benefited those who are stayed here. So that is the impact of, uh, of the impact of the wage and employment impact of unskilled migration. Uh, now the important issue here is that whether it is, uh, happens everywhere, no, it may not be. It also depends upon the institutional and other aspects in uh, other uh, aspects in the countries of origin. For example, in a society where the trade unions are strong and, uh, and trade union laws are strong, it is possible that a shortage in labor force can lead to higher wage. Similarly, the ex it also depends upon the volume of migrants. If the migrants accounts for only a small portion of the uh, total labor force in the countries of origin that we cannot expect a larger impact on wage of employment and another issue is that if the migrants if the migrants are not part of, uh, migrants are not the migrants the people who, who migrated are, were not participating in the labor force earlier then also we cannot see any much impact on wage and uh, wage also for example uh, uh, for example uh, for uh, this uh, Domestic workers, that is, the, 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 the women usually migrate to other countries for doing domestic work. They may not be participating in the, the labor force of the countries of origin. So we, in that case, we cannot expect a larger in, in impact of migrants on the wage or employment situation of unskilled people in the countries of origin. Now, uh, th 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 this is the story on unskilled migration. Now we consider that skilled migration uh, the skilled migration uh, is increasing over time and many con developed countries are encouraging uh, skilled migration the reason is the reason is that uh, uh, so this will in the availability of skilled migration skilled migrants allow uh, increases the productivity of these countries and uh, what as you may be or as you may be aware of that during the particularly during the last 30 40 years what you can see is that uh, a technological progress which is highly uh, skill biased technological progress that is what is the skill biased technological progress is that uh, to implement this technological progress we need skilled labor so what happens is that this technological progress increases the demand for uh, skilled workers so 
once you have increased demand for skilled workers, this the wage rate will also increase because when you have a, a skilled labor force compared with the new technology, which essentially in, definitely increases their productivity and the results in higher wage. So what we have seen is that for the last some for some decade for the last few decades, that is this uh, skilled uh, skill biased technological progress and the and incentives provided by the countries of destination contributed to the increase in the uh, increase in the skilled migration. But however, we don't have any data on the extent of skilled migration or these things. So we, we are to, we are to uh, we don't have we are to just make guesses on these things. And now. Uh, the important, uh, similar to unskilled migration, skilled migration also benefit the migrants, their families, as well as reduce the labor market pressures. And another important thing is that skilled migration also uh, improve, uh, creates a well-educated diaspora that is that is helpful that that is beneficial for the country of origin in many ways. We, some of the ways we will discuss later. For example, you have a, when you have a large diaspora board, it is possible for you to uh, access capital, access technological technology, as well as it also helps you to uh, it also helps you to increase your trade. All these things. So these are the benefits of a diaspora that some countries value. Because diaspora is contributed to the foreign exchange earnings, and the, 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 apart from what is called the, the trade, then, uh, for example, in, in there are some studies in the context in India context. India India's export to Gulf is largely driven by migration to Gulf because it is this migrant Gulf migrants in Gulf demand many things, but that they prefer. Uh, products from India rather than from particularly food products. So that is the one advantage of skilled migration. That is, it sometimes leads to more networking and uh, thereby more export flows as well as technology flows. Then another important thing is that uh, return migrants is also significantly contributed to development of the countries of origin because this technical, technical, this uh, high skilled skilled people will go and work there for some time and they come back. So this return migrants is considered to be uh, considered uh, believed, believed to be capable of contributing to the growth and development of these countries of origin, for because they come, they will be able to come. They, they, they may have import their technology skills, entrepreneurial skills. There are some studies on these things. For example, return migrants. Uh, that is the world development. Paper that is essentially looking at the how return migrants contributed to increase entrepreneurship in rural China, and the journal that journal of development paper is uh, important uh, for, for they, they are, here they are going the term pain gain because when we are discussing the issue of skilled migration, what, what the, the usual terminology we heard is that of pain drain that is. Uh, skilled people are moving out of this developing and underdeveloping region, but they, it is, they are going the term brain gain because they, when they move upward, then after that, sometimes they come back, they will have the technological progress level of this will be higher. And they are showing their argument is that it will be beneficial for the country to do that. But apart from that, there are some there are some sectors that are for particularly for the poor and underdeveloped countries, skilled migration is sometimes a problem. Uh, for example, in most of the poor countries or undeveloping countries, education is highly subsidized, particularly higher education. So if people are moving out of the country, means that it is a loss to the exchequer. Second thing is that uh, now if a larger part of the people are moving out it means that you I think you must have heard about uh, human capital spillovers human capital spillovers means that uh, uh, that is if, uh, if there is an agglomeration of the highly skilled people like 
that in Silicon Valley, what happens is that uh, learning and innovation rate will be very high, and uh, that is technological progress will be very high. So the spillovers or externalities essentially a function of the stock of the people. If a large, if there is only one person, you cannot expect any spillovers. If there is there are two people, you can expect that there can be an exchange among these two. If there are three people, one person get uh, information from two people. If there are four people, one person will get information from three people, remaining three people. So as stock increases, the, the, the extent of spillovers also increases. So it means that if large number of people are moving out of the country, that is technically trained people, that is the that spillover rate will increase. So this is essentially the that may reduce the uh, that may reduce the, the rate of technological progress in the countries of origin. And that is the one thing. Second thing is that if a specialized trade, especially trained people are moving out, it may reduce the uh, the ability to supply some of the very technical services in the countries of origin. For example, you may need a very specialized trained train, train person for performing a particular task. To uh, part, that may be a part of a large of task. If that for that uh, we don't have qualified persons, then that entire task will not be able to uh, perform. So that is that is the, uh, the problem with this uh, issues related to human capital spillovers. Then uh, another important thing is that. Uh, uh, for instance, it may, our ability to provide many of the specialized services will also decline. For example, World Bank reports that uh, at least 12% of the doctors trained in India live in the United Kingdom. So you can see that India has a shortage of medical trained people, medical doctors, and, may, and I think it's a very known thing. And we are also making a effort to fill this gap by one suggestion is to reduce the number of training years to compile for, for some kind of intermediate degree or these things. But you can see that uh, uh, so there is a the shortage in the given these shortage with people are moving out. And so for example, and the, and the Ethiopian Ethiopia lost half of its pathology graduates from 1984 to 96 for poor country like that. Right? They cannot be they may not be able to afford that. And then more severe case you can see by a paper, a paper by this paper, Starker, they report that migration to developed countries in Jamaica have to, means that they have to train five doctors to retain one and Grenada has to train 22 doctors to keep just one. That is the kind of uh, migration. So that is affecting their health sector. Now the issue is that is there are, but there are some counter arguments also is that uh, suppose we are restricting the migration then what will happen the, here the argument is that if we allow educated or skilled migration then what happens is that uh, the prospects of migration encourage people to undergo that training so opportunity to emigrate increases the returns to education here and therefore more people will invest in education with the view to emigrate. But actually what happens is that only only four fraction of them actually migrate. So what happens is that if the increase in the human capital is more than the, those who are migrated, then it is it creates a net benefit to the society. I think you may be the best example can be the IT, uh, the uh, that is those IT skill formation in India. Earlier, people were migrating, uh, well, there was a process for migration, now also it is there. So, people and wage, uh, the return to, uh, to IT training is very high. A large number of people entered in that area. And now, what you can see that here, here the stock has increased a lot. There were people are moving out, may not be an issue for us. Uh, so that is the case, uh, that is the prospects of migration encourage people to undergo that training that will actually increase the overall stock of that skill, in, skill set. And there is one paper in this area uh, 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 that uh, they shows that, uh, they shows that uh, 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 the migration prospects actually increase to the uh, number of people who are undergoing the training. I think it is in the graduate training.
that is there is another study which reports that uh, migration has no impact on secondary education but uh, it has impact on the uh, college of education now coming to the Now what we have seen is that uh, skilled migration, which has pluses and minuses. Pluses are essentially it leads to a larger, uh, what is called a diaspora, increase remittances, and uh, and sometimes also leads to more human capital formation in the country of origin. So and it also reduces the pressure on labor market in the countries of origin so many countries encourage skilled migration for example china cuba india philippines Sri Lanka. we all have programs to facilitate training for migration we encourage migration of nurses and technically trained people and this because this will reduce how the pressure on domestic market and the, we also get what is called remittances and they have also, and many countries also encourage return migration because that, that is also a source of technological upliftment as well as what is uh, the, uh, as well as it encourages entrepreneurship in uh, entrepreneurship. So, for example, China's policies, Philippines, Taiwan, and these countries provide various type of incentives like uh, uh, liberal uh, R&D, R&D grant, tax incentives. And, and uh, similarly, tax incentives and educational facilities, all these things. So, they are also encouraging pattern migrants. But this, particularly China, is encouraging high skilled people, uh, people, technically trained people, to improve their domestic capacity. So, this is the now what we have uh, so far developed, uh, discussed is uh, impact of. Of, uh, impact of migration on the domestic. So here we divided the entire uh, this entire structure into skilled and unskilled migration. Skilled and unskilled migration is, is good for for the migrant as well as for those who are uh, as well as for the countries of origin. And, uh, and it is quite possible that unskilled migration also improves the living standard of those with. Uh, countries in the countries of origin what more first by reducing the pressure on the domestic labor market and it is also possible that unskilled migration also results in a lot of remittances these remittances when they spend in the domestic market also generate more opportunities so that is the unskilled migration but when it comes to a skilled migration that is the skilled migration has is beneficial for the uh, for the migrant as well as for families, but when it comes to the countries of origin, uh, it is it has its own problems. For example, it, uh, it is uh, particularly uh, in poor countries, skilled migration is an issue because they may not be able to provide the services. For example, this is particularly in the context of health services. We have already seen that, but there are my largely populated countries like India and China, which are also. Uh, developing uh, developing countries and therefore have a reasonable uh, really good education system particularly uh, so what happens is that uh, they are encouraging skilled migration but uh, partly to reduce the pressure on the domestic market as well as to value the diaspora a large diaspora as well as they also value the uh, better skilled return migrants and so this are the so this is our uh, this is our understanding uh, the current literature on the skilled and unskilled migration. Now we, uh, the the first part of the uh, one part of the lecture is over. Now we will discuss the the remittances development around. But before going that, those who are want to get more information or get more familiar with the literature as well as the issues in migration and development, there are many three documents out of this OEC 2017 is a very good uh, source where it gives the importance of public policies and what uh, is in improving the or 
increasing the developmental effect of migration and remittances. Similarly, World Bank 2006 is also very good reference. It gives you a lot of information on that and the status of the literature. And there is one more publication by, I think, UNICEF. It will come. Now, when we discuss the, what we have already seen is that uh, there are uh, the top 30 countries which is receiving, uh, they are receiving remittances. All of them have remittances more than 10% of their GDP. So it is an important source of external resource for them. So in, uh, in our discussion of the discussion of the impact of remittances, we uh, uh, organize this. First we discuss its macroeconomic impact because it is in terms of flow, it is very significant. Because some, uh, there are uh, in some uh, there are countries which is uh, were in that in their, for them it is more than forty percent remittance it is more than forty percent around forty percent is there. so it's that in terms of size it is important so it has important macroeconomic impact then we will look at the impact on households how uh, we all uh, we focus on the developmental aspects we will not consider the other aspects so, uh, other now the first thing is that uh, remittances can. It is there is an argument that uh, remittances sometimes can uh, uh, impact stability to economic activities in the country of origin because remittances are counter cyclical. The counter cyclical means that if the economy is in the is is in a recession, then workers that is uh, migrated workers will send more to support their families. On the other hand, economy is on a booming side, booming side, booming phase. What happens is that the domestic market is going well, and the revenue is going well. At that point, the remittances may be lower. So, in that way, in a macroeconomic sense, it is possible that remittances can inject some kind of stability to the economy. That is the because it also smooth consumption. The why migrants are sending more in times of disaster is that it to help the family to support consumption now there are number of studies examine these issues for example this is the uh, that is in the case of latin american and american caribbean and uh, uh, similarly uh, uh, there are studies on immigrant whether immigrant remittances are in response to business cycles so that is the important one important uh, the macroeconomic effect of remittances in countries with where it is its size is very high, it impacts some kind of stability. Now, usually we are concerned with economic growth. The question is whether remittances can contribute to economic growth. Here, uh, we don't have a very clear answer. The reason is that we're getting uh, the important. The, here the issue is that since remittances are counter cyclical, eliciting the growth effects of remittances is sometimes difficult because when you correlate remittances and growth and economic growth, you can see a negative relationship. Remittances growth is higher whenever the economy is, is performing poorly. So, but so, but there are studies which which examine this issue, and once the, we will see these studies, and these studies says that uh, remittances encourage economic growth in those countries where financial sector is not developed. For example, whether a financial system is underdeveloped, remittances appear to avoid alleviate credit constraint and thereby stimulate economic growth because remittances provides credit sources to the people to take investment. So that is that we will discuss this issue later. But uh, in this uh, review, I am not uh, yeah, here in this review, I have not included uh, studies which is linking economic growth and remittances directly because instead I focused on studies which is exploring the channels, various channels through which remittances and growth can be, uh, channels through which remittances and growth is related. Are related. Now, the important for small poor countries, the important thing is that there is now remittances increase the credit worthiness of these countries because remittances are external costs and these are non debt flows. 
and therefore this will improve the credit rate, ex external credit rating of these countries. Now, for example, UNDP 2011, this is also a good reference for understanding the migration issues, which says that uh, remittances are now factored into sovereign ratings in middle income countries and the debt to sustainability analysis of low income countries. Uh, so, so the response study which accepted, which shows that uh, remittances actually impose the credit rating of these countries. That is the credit worthiness. So that is the other aspect. Now another important how remittances affect the structure and growth of an economy. Whether it's something, whether it's an argument called the Dutch disease effect. Here, I, you, I don't know whether you heard about Dutch disease. It's not a disease. That's a disease, you know, it is not a disease as such. The reason is that, uh, that it, the term emerged in the context of Netherlands. The Netherlands, uh, in, uh, when there was a gasoline boom happened, what happened that this sector, in uh, that gasoline sector expanded and it uh, maybe said, uh, uh, it, it, uh, contracted, it shrinked, it contracted all other sectors of all the, 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 the uh, other sectors, tradable sectors of the economy. Here the logic is this. The, 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 the logic here is that the mechanism, the, I mean, migration implies a move of movement of resources, factors of production outside the country. And so it is possible that there can be a uh, shortage of resources within the country. Second, on the other hand, remittances means that uh, resources are coming into the country, more in the external flows. A boom is happening. A large and continuous flow of resources are, uh, what happens is that uh, suppose households are getting resources from outside, so what we will do? We will spend we will, in an open, in a small open economy, what we will do? This is we are considering in the context of a small open economy. We will spend on our essential commodities like food and shelter. After that, we will spend more on many, many services. The problem here is that services are non-tradable commodities. So if the if there is if the elasticity of demand, if, if the income elasticity of demand for services is higher than one, an increase in income for remittances leads to more than proportionate increase in the demand for services. So what happens is that the demand for services will increase and these services has to be produced. These are non-tradable and therefore you cannot go and buy from your other neighboring country or neighboring region. It has to be produced within that region. In that case, increase in demand is to increase in the price of these services, and this this increase in, and the, by increase their profitability, and this will attract resources from tradable sectors of the economy, that is manufacturing and agriculture. So the, their price cannot we cannot they cannot increase because they are facing competition from the outside. So if you are suppose. For example, in Kerala, what you can see is that many services are costly and agriculture and share of agriculture and manufacturing is very low. Agriculture, uh, maybe total is around maybe 12% or something. And eight, around like more than 80% of the economy accounts for services. Because services, you can, uh, tradable commodities, manufacturing commodities and agriculture products, you can import from other places if the price is higher. So it means that uh, the real exchange rate, that is the ratio of tradable sector price to non-tradable sector price will increase. And this will uh, discourage the manufacturing and agriculture products. And then also is that uh, the expansion of the non-tradable sector increase the wage rate of the factors of production, wage rate of the wage rate and, and the tradable sector may not be able to Price cost of tradable sector will also increase, but the, that what happens is the increased cost will discourage production. Instead of producing domestically, you can import it. So that is the that's this is idea. The here the logic is that the increase in remittances and migration contribute to increase the uh, appreciation of the real exchange rate of that region. That is the tradable non-tradable sector price to non tradable sector price. So, and this, this uh, adversely affect the competitiveness of the manufacturing and agriculture. 
and so the economy will move in such a way that too, the trade of non tradable sector will expand tradable sector will contract so this result in the shifting of resources from tradable to non tradable sectors of the economy and hence expansion of the non tradable sector which has implications for employment and skill formation here the implications is that too, we, we know that uh, manufacturing provides employment opportunities for a large number of people. For getting a job in a decent job in manufacturing, you don't need a big training. In manufacturing, a larger part of the training happens on the shop floor. That is when learning by doing. So, so what happens is that, uh, but in, in, to get a job in the service sector, decent job in service sector, you need a reasonable education. For example, banking, insurance, all these things. To get a job, you need a, at least a graduation. But in manufacturing, you don't need that much skill. So what happens is that uh, manufacturing usually, manufacturing and agriculture usually generate a lot of mass employment opportunities for skilled and unskilled people. So if these sectors are contracting, means that uh, these employment opportunities will not be the wage unemployment will increase. And then another thing is the skill formation. I did learn in manufacturing, if you are uh, in manufacturing sector, learning by doing will happen. That is, your skill will improve when you work in that area. But if you don't have an opportunity to do that, your skill learning by doing will not happen and therefore technological progress will not happen. So that will also in the long run produce the competitiveness of the manufacturing sector. This is the Dutch disease effect. And here uh, the issue is that uh, this will happen when there is a large inflow of resources. The large inflow of resources, uh, resources are booming sectors. Now there are a number of studies examining these issues. Uh, for example, that this is a remittances, and and uh, you can see it. And in Kerala's context, there are a number of studies I was recently examined. For example, Balakrishna in 1999, while examining well agriculture, particularly rice production in Kerala, uh, Kerala uh, uh, declined. He attributed this to the growing migration from. Uh, India uh, from Kerala, uh, uh, that's a disease phenomenon. So, and this argument is later extended by Hedlal and Joseph to explain the de industrialization of uh, in, uh, uh, in Kerala, that is, the share of the industry, manufacturing industry, declined drastically. And to explain that phenomena, Hedlal and Joseph use this argument that is, increased remittances and migration. In recent paper, in what I did is that I examined the, the last, the, these two first two papers, Balakrishnan and Harilal and Joseph. They were making an argument, but they were, they were, not, providing, they were not providing a, a empirical evidence on that. But in, the, in what I did in the recent paper is that I verified this, uh, uh, this argument in the context of Kerala. What we have seen is that uh, okay, okay, that is remittances and migration is increased the relative price of non-tradables in Kerala. Similarly, it contracted the uh, man, uh, tradable sector, agriculture industry, and increased the uh, and expanded the the non-tradable service sector. And I have also seen that uh, when this kind of thing happens, wage rate in the system will increase. What I have seen is that uh, the remittances and migration increase the wage rate of even the agricultural laborers in Kerala. Because agricultural laborers are largely, they are not the people who migrated, and therefore, if similarly, and they are not that organized as the, uh, as the uh, organ manufacturing industry, uh, labor in the manufacturing industries. So their wage has gone up means that. Uh, the maintenance of work of the labor market leads to increase, that is, remittances and migration leads to increase demand for labor and which contribute to an increase of wage rate. So, of course, in Kerala, it is a special case in the sense that Kerala is a, can be considered a small open economy. Whenever there is a price increase in the price of agriculture products, it can import it, products comes from Tamil Nadu. Is 
agriculture activities in this in this region. And an option for to, if, 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 so if the region wants to move out of this uh, uh, tax space, the only option is that uh, uh, it has to increase its technological progress so that uh, productivity is higher and uh, product, higher productivity can compensate for the higher wage rate. And you can also see that uh, this increase uh, at the later stage of the death CTC stage, what happens is that the wage rate will increase at a very high level so that uh, at the initial level, what have initial stages, wage rate will increase, as wage rate increases, domestic production will get discouraged and we start importing from outside. This is going to happen. And a further increase in the wage rate will happen. So in that first case, what happens is that a small increase in the wage rate, commodities move from neighboring regions to the country, uh, the country, the region of our concern. That is, and the, if a further increase in the wage rate leads to, instead of commodities, laborers will move. That is how in the third stage, uh, later stage of the development and what you can see is that uh, laborers are migrating from other parts of India into Kerala. So that is because of the higher wage rate available and this is in this point the remittances and uh, migration played an important role in this process. Now another issue which may not be important for uh, India or Kerala but uh, it is important for other uh, countries uh, uh, as we are already seeing that the countries accounts for more than 10 percent of their GDP to rem remittances account for more than 10 percent of their GDP in these countries remittances are very high so it is, there is an argument this kind of resource boom resource boom can lead to, uh, to the deterioration in quality of the institutions of governance uh, here, this is usually you must you, you, so you may have heard about the resource cost economics. But when you have more resources, instead of leading to prosperity, it leads to uh, sometimes it leads to poverty. This is the resource cost. Why? This is a true in the case of most of the number of African countries where resources are rich in terms of diamonds, natural resources, and gold, all these things. And similarly, some of the um, uh, Middle East countries were oil is uh, rich, the oil rich, these are all resource rich, but in, instead of they becoming richer, they are becoming poorer. So why this is, this is the reason is that this increase in resources leads to poor uh, institutional deterioration, that they are supposed to govern, particularly governance institutions, in order to get the rent, uh, larger rent to provide. Uh, rent made possible by these resources, sometimes there will be a civil war or form, or there will be increase in corruption, all these things happen. So what happened in that case, what happens is that governance gets distorted. So this is the, so there is an argument that uh, it will be, that is increase in resources uh, in terms of from, through this uh, remittances can be to the quality institution quality institution. Uh, for your reference, I have included Bursar and Swami Subramanian. They, they argue that uh, if, uh, if uh, they, in the context of Iraq, they argue that uh, if Iraq wants to move uh, out of its goals, it has to distribute its uh, resources in, uh, among larger populations so that uh, there won't be any clash over these resources. In this context, in the, uh, there is an argument that uh, it is, it is also argued that uh, remittances are uh, widely distributed among the members of the society and government is not playing a middleman role. For example, in the case of uh, mining resources of oil, government is capturing these resources and playing a middleman role and, middle, and, uh, and to get govern, governance governments a lot of rent. So there is a infighting happens for capturing the government. But this will not happen in the case of remittances because it is distributed among a large number of people. But still, there is an argument that it leads to a quality, low quality institution. There are some studies examining this issue. For example, a big population global development, they are examining the how remittances, whether remittances is contributing to poor quality institutions. Their argument is that. Uh, they argue that higher ratio of remittances to GDP leads to lower indices of control of corruption. 
government effectiveness and whole of law even after converting for potential reverse causality. Here, I want to, when you go to the paper, what you can see is that uh, remittances are unearned income, where you are getting income where the effort is not, not made by you people, but some by the, by the countries of Kona, but it is happening in other places. And another thing is that uh, uh, you are, this is also equal, you are becoming rich without much effort. If a country wants to become rich, it has to make a lot of transformations. It has to improve its quality, its governance, it has to improve its the institutions, it has to uh, develop some uh, kind of self-discipline in managing all these institutions. So, in that case, more resources may not lead to deteriorating quality of institutions because we, we learn how to manage the richness. But in the case of remittances, richness is coming without any of these preparations. So, or without any of these experiences. Not in the, so, is that it may be more current. That is, that is the core of the argument. That is, you have more money, you don't have that, then you have upward systems to you, you effectively utilize that money. So that is the argument. So uh, they are, they are similarly on the paper uh, also say the same remittances as increased corruption, especially in known countries. This because in OECD other countries they probably have the uh, apparatus to manage the resources of business, but uh, the countries which is not having the resources of it, the apparatus or to manage the business, they may enter into more corruption. Now, this is the, uh, I, the I, uh, channel which I mentioned first that one important uh, issue discussed in the literature is remittances can contribute to the development of the financial sector. The financial development is that it will improve the uh, uh, access to credit, it will uh, alleviate credit constraint and also gives some kind of uh, working capital to the people. A large number of studies examine this issue and uh, their argument is that remittances can act as a substitute for less financial development. Here, uh, and the, the, some studies go further and they say that uh, uh, particularly the second one, Isabella, they argue that the remittances uh, impact on growth is mediated through the financial channel. They, what they are showing is that the remittances, as a, as a remittances have a positive effect on economic growth in those countries where financial sector is not developed well. So remittances is acting as a substitute for financial sector and the uh, uh, relaxing the financial constraint. In those countries where financial sector is well developed, remittances does not have much effect on growth. So the, in their argument, the channel of, uh, cha that is remittances impact on, the, the direct impact of remittances of economic growth is by acting as a substitute for financial development. Now this is the, the this is the macroeconomic impact of remittances, and so far what we have we have discussed uh, the stability that is remittances can import stability on the economic system because this is a counter cyclical when the economy is, uh, is, is on the downward cycle. What happens is that the remittances will increase because this is because uh, the migrants give more money when they are more, when the families are in distress. Second thing, second thing we have discussed is that migrants uh, remittances can increase the credit worthiness of the country, and this is important particularly for the poor African countries where we have already seen that they have come from large share of remittances. Then, and uh, remittances also now incorporated the debt sustainability analysis in poor countries, as well as it is also included in the in determining the credit rating of these countries. So, because remittances are non debt creating crops. Then, third factor we have, third channel we have when these remittances can have a, um, can contribute to the, can, have, can affect the structure of the economy. It can affect the relate competitiveness of the trade of the sector, namely manufacturing and the industry. And by changing, by leading to an appreciation of the real exchange rate. This is because if we are, if, 
if we spend more, I mean, a larger proportion of government resources on non trainable sectors, the de their demand will increase and it has to extract resources from other sectors of the economy to meet that demand. And so other sectors have to compete for resources and they cannot increase their price because they are in, they are tradable and they are in the tradable sector and they can also they are facing competition from outside. So what happens is that it will remittances and migration will reduce the competitiveness of the tradable sector and this leads to the, uh, the contraction of the tradable sector and expansion of the non-tradable sector and this has implications for the uh, for the skill formation and employment because manufacturing and agriculture usually provide a massive unemployment for skilled and unskilled people uh, but uh, non-tradable services usually does not do that to many employment so and similarly manufacturing also uh, encourage learning by doing and uh, technology and learning by doing and uh, skill formation so if you don't have an opportunity to work if a society does not have an opportunity if members of the society does not have an opportunity to work in the manufacturing sector they will be deprived of this opportunity also that is the ability to learn so it will have an implications on long-term growth prospects of that economy so this is also we found then then we are, what we are found is that uh, the in, uh, remittances can affect the institutions in the society institutions are essentially con is considered to be the uh, uh, considered to be the uh, the deep uh, deep factors determining growth so it is it can deteriorate then financial development and which that is uh, in uh, remittances can uh, can act as a substitute for financial development and through this it can affect the economic growth. Now the, uh, this is the last part and we have uh, remittances impact on households and uh, also in, in remittances can affect households, it can, the poverty can be reduced, it can smooth household consumption, it can enhance investment in education and encourage investment at entrepreneurship. And for those who are interested in the, for those who are working in these areas, one important reference is Adams 2011. This paper provides a detailed review of around 50 household level empirical studies on the economic impact of remittances. It is published in the Journal of Development Studies. Because I have seen that a large number of participants are from PhD, doing PhD for, and uh, young field. So it is used those who are interested, they can read this paper. They will get a link. Now we discuss that in this, uh, in, the, in this here. What I do is that I will briefly explain the issues involved and some of the studies. What is the, what is the person literates on this thing? That is where the person literates stand on this uh, how impact of remittances on poverty. The remittances can directly affect the poverty by the migrant. And remittances can also affect the poverty of those who are uh, those who are staying there through indirectly by increasing the growth rate of that country. Now, empirical so empirical evidence on remittances on poverty come from mainly from three types of studies. One is poverty simulation studies, and this cross-country regression studies, and studies based on household survey data. These poverty simulation studies, these are simulation studies. They have a model. And they, what they, these studies do is that uh, they, uh, uh, still, they, they say what would have, they usually check for counterfactual. What would be the impact? What would have been the impact on remittances if the remittances is zero? So that that is the, that is the way they do. Then cross country regression studies. These are regression studies using cross country data where poverty is the some measure of poverty is the dependent variable and. Uh, and the explanatory variable included many, many things, including uh, some measure of uh, uh, remittances. Then there is a, another third set of studies, which is examining the impact of remittances on poverty using household survey data. And the important, I think I, yeah, we will first discuss this, these three set of studies, what, what, the, what they're saying on this. this. Then we will, uh, there is a difference between the, between the uh, evidences provided by these three studies because the poverty simulation and cross country studies capture something more than the studies using household data. Now, 
when we can sense some poverty that are large. Uh, yeah, one important simulation model is by World Bank 2006, it is given in that chapter. Uh, they're, they're using 81 countries, and these studies show the significant poverty reduction effect of remittances. And uh, there is a, uh, the, I, as I come across only this study, the simulation study only this 2006 World Bank. And another one important study by Adams and Page, it's they're using 71 countries, post country data, and their argument is that both international migration and remittance have significantly reduced the level, depth, and severity of poverty in the developing world. So they are considering both the level means that it can be headcount ratio of poverty, the number of people in the number of poor people in the population. That means that it is some measure of intensity of poverty or severity. So their argument is that it is affecting both all the three dimensions of poverty. Now, similarly, there are cost and studies and there are also countries which are focusing on specific regions. For example, Gupta, all these things focusing on sub-Saharan Africa. Similarly, Acosta focuses on Latin America. And all these countries are for it's, all these studies show that uh, remittances have a significant poverty reduction effect. And here, the, the first study group that also shows that uh, remittances also promote financial development and uh, the poverty reduction is through all these panels also. And uh, along with the poverty studies, some studies also look at uh, uh, the impact of inequality also. So that will be considered later. So, uh, the, this is an Ethiopian, the African countries have more number of studies on poverty. Uh, that's our, uh, and uh, as these studies also found that there was no impact on inequality. Now we come to the difference in that. Uh, now, poverty simulation studies and post country economic studies capture both the direct and indirect effect of remittance of support because in post country studies and, and uh, Post country studies and simulation studies, your dependent variable is the poverty rate in one, that country or in one country, and your other side is the in either side is the remittances along with the other variables. So it captures all the indirect direct as well as indirect mechanism. For example, if the remittances can have multiplier effect. For example, we may get remittances, we spend it, and that spending will encourage a lot of employment and give income to the other people. That is the multiplier effect. So, first uh, time regression studies and simulation studies capture the direct effect as well as indirect effect of remittances on poverty. But on, in the case of uh, uh, in, but the household level studies cannot capture the indirect effect of indirect because we are considering only that household. If those households having remittances, whether they are poor or not, that is the one issue. Now, what you can see is that there is no clear conclusion on the effect of remittances on inequality. This, in some cases, remittances may go, this is because in some cases, remittances may be going to already better of households, and so this may be widening the disparities. On the other hand, in some cases, uh, what happens is that, uh, what happens is that uh, remittances is going to the poor sections and allowing them to move up, and in that case, it will cause the disparity. So, the inequality depends but the impact of impact of remittances on inequality depends upon which section of the society is getting uh, remittances. But it is possible that even if the remittances are getting in the richer section in the society, through multiply effect on all these things, it poor sections may also get benefit. So, so remittances can that may be the reason why poverty impact of remittances is widespread, but inequality impact is not that widespread. So we cannot see, we, we are unable to see that widely. Now, uh, we are already said that one important issue is macroeconomic uh, is the consumption smoothing. This, this has also important implications for the household level. And so in some of the countries, migration is used as an insurance for uh, insurance, uh, insurance. That is, when there is a crop failure or income fall. 
okay, that is to smooth consumption, migration is the option people adopted. Uh, so people have different ways of ensuring this uh, from this risk. So informal community organizations, but for, for example, if it is an individual specific risk, you can see the help of your neighbors. But suppose if it is a community wide risk, then community, your neighbor may not be able to help you like the community by the crop failure of natural disasters. In such a context, usually people what they do is that they try to mitigate the risk by sending family members to other regions or countries where they are not likely to face the same shock that the household face. In this context, I think is uh, this, this is this is the inbuilt in the marriages in southern India. That is paper by Rosenberg and Starr, which is the they, the what their argument they are that they, they in, in South, South Indian villages the marriages are usually happen between remote villages, not near near in the, not in the same villages, but in the remote villages. Their argument is that this arrangement is to mitigate the risk. Suppose there is a crop failure or some disaster in one village, they can use their relationship to mitigate that because they can use the, uh, the marriage, that is the relationship, uh, marriage relationship to mitigate that risk. So that, uh, so that is in this case also, my, migration through marriage is used to mitigate the risk. Or to kind of smoke consumption. So now there are a number of studies on the impact of uh, impact of uh, remittances on my consumption smoking. For example, Lucas and shows that remittances to Botswana increase with the extent of drought in the migrant home region, and responsiveness to remittances level to drought was greater for households with more drought sensitive assets such as cattle. Similarly, uh, there was uh, Calvert, Betty, and Sparrow shows that in the context of Ecuador, the remittances is used for smoking consumption as well as for financing education when households face a negative income shock. So this is uh, uh, this is the uh, this is uh, the important one that it's macroeconomic version we have more for this year. Whenever there is a downside moment, the remittances is increasing. Now there is an uh, it is also possible that uh, increased remittances can affect labor force participation rate. Usually the argument is that if the household receiving remittances, their reservation wage will increase. That is the wage at which they are willing to work will increase. So what happens is that uh, remittances sometimes leads to lower labor force participation rate. So this has been a number of studies verified it. And, uh, and they are showing that remittances is associated with the power of labor force participation uh, and uh, labor labor force participation. Here, uh, this is a negative outcome, but here the issue is that uh, it is also a welfare effect because you are now uh, you have more income and therefore you are not uh, uh, working more, but instead of taking more leisure. Now, another uh, aspect is that uh, that is remittances in most uh, cases is the credit constraint faced by the households, and it also encourages them to make investment. And uh, so, Lucas on paper, which we already mentioned, argues that uh, the migration to South Africa means initially reduce the agricultural production in countries of origin because people migrated to because of the labor shortage. However, over time, production increased with the migration due to remittances funded capital investment. And people were also ready to take a risk because they have two sources of income. One is their agricultural income and they have the remittances. And therefore, the remittances also encouraged it a more risk taking also. Similar evidence is also generated in the context of China. Well, what happens is that a rural urban migration the initially reduced the uh, agricultural production in rural area, but later it increased the production because the, invest, the remittances allowed the farmers to make investment and this contributed to increase productivity. 
So this is so that this happens when people use their remittances to uh, save and invest. When this happens, it is possible that uh, suppose you see this remittances are going to be temporary flow of income. In that case, what happens is that people save all this money and make to obtain income and invest in income earning activities. On the other hand, if people view that remittances as something permanent, they may not they may, may take as a like long uh, source of income and therefore they may not opt for an investment source. There is, there is this is the picture we get from the literature. Now the last part is, uh, is impact on education and health. Here I want to clarify one thing. When we talk about the impact of uh, migration and remittances or impact on education and health, it is most of the studies which are focusing, which are examining this issue focus on expenditure, health expenditure or education expenditure. But it is possible that uh, when you get more remittances, you may spend more on education and more on health. But what is the outcome? Whether your children are studying well or your, uh, your parents or children are getting better health. It also depends if both parents are migrated or one of them are migrated, it is possible that the uh, outcome may deviate from the deviate. For example, if there is no parental supervision and care what happens is that you may spend more on education, but the educational outcome may not be may not improve. Similarly, in health also, if you if you don't have parental care and, and supervision, if you're the old old people in the home or children, then we may spend more on them, but we may not be able to ensure better health outcomes. So the, when we evaluate the studies in this context, we most uh, as we will see, most of the studies focus on expense and outcome side, maybe because we don't have um, outcome side in our studies is very low. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah, an important, yeah, in this case, an important paper by Yang, which is published in the Economic Journal, which shows that in, in the context of in, in Philippines, when there was a 2008 financial crisis, which led to the depreciation of the Philippines currency, when the currency depreciates, what happens is that your remittances have more value in terms of domestic currency, which leads to an increase in remittances. In that context, we examine whether this increased remittances contributed to uh, what is called uh, as more uh, uh, and education and investment expenditure. What we have found is that uh, child schooling and educational expenditure increase, child labor declined, also, also worked more hours in self employment. This is essentially means that people become more entrepreneurs and become most and also started capital intensive household enterprises. So, this all thing. Similarly, uh, in the Colombian case, also shows that uh, remittances reduce child labor but not schooling. Uh, and related, uh, and similar in the case of Nepal, it also says that uh, remittances increase the non food expenditure, including education spending. But this, this study also reports that it is not, they are not finding any impact on educational outcomes. It does, so that, that this means maybe yeah, this is also related to the, the uh, characteristics of migration. In some cases, if mothers are migrating or, or both parents are migrating, then the education we may be spending more, but education outcome may not be good. So, yeah, the number of studies are there, for example. Like, uh, ah, yeah, this is else, some other paper is very important. The service that remittances reduce the probability uh, help the, uh, retaining the children in school. Is, that is dropout rate declined drastically because of the remittances. Yeah, the, the similar thing we can also see in the context of what is called a, uh, health expenditure also. But here also health expenditure. But there are the, the last study which is I not here, which also gives some 
uh, evidence on what is called deworming and vaccination also. And here, and this study also because that the migration is also contributed to input more in knowledge about the health. So this is uh, this is a, a not apart from increased expenditure, but now the migrant families also have better information about the health practices. So this is the broad idea of how migration and develop remittances has contributed to the various aspects of development. Now I it is as I already told at the outset, we are focused, we focus on the economic some aspects of development. Development is a multi-dimensional concept, includes many dimensions, including higher income, better, better health, uh, better education, more security, similar more uh, voice and confidence in governance, improved governance, and similarly you have better social connections and many other and more better environmental conditions. So we are focused only on one many economic and human development aspects only and other aspects we are not considered. It is also possible that it can develop a migration and remittances can contribute to can have many non-economic benefits for example uh, if, if, if the main member of the household is migrated then usually the household needs to be managed by the female member it create a lot of tension and stress and, and uh, similarly uh, and this is for in the case of managing the children's education all these cases and this can this lot this can this create a lot of emotional Issues of these things. This is the other, and similarly, it can lead to uh, migration, can lead to different cultural changes, changes in food habits, all these things. I, I we have been witnessing these issues in Kerala. So these aspects I have not covered. I covered only the important aspects only. And those who want to get a bit more information, more, more details on these things, I have all. I think I have put up important, almost important references in the slides. I, I think it is accessible to you. And within that, one important, three important references which you can easily read and understand and get a very comprehensive broad idea about the migration and development nexus. Is one is by World Bank 2006. OEC in 2017. These two publications are because these two publications cover a broad overview of the issues involved as well as the importance of public policy. And yeah, this World Bank publication also discusses the issues involved in the estimation of remittances. And they have a section on, they have estimated it using different methods. So these. You, 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 those who are interested in these issues can consult.